Among the mountain solitudes of northern Italy, a people exiled to the wilderness kept the light of truth burning throughout the darkness of the Middle Ages. God had provided for his people a sanctuary of awful grandeur, befitting the mighty truths committed to their trust. To those faithful exiles, the mountains were an emblem of the immutable righteousness of Jehovah. They were a constant witness to God's creative power and a never-failing assurance of his protecting care. God, who had set fast the mountains and girded them with strength so that no arm but that of infinite power could move them out of their place, in like manner had established his law, the foundation of his government in heaven and upon earth. Amid the gloom that settled upon the earth during the long period of papal supremacy, the light of truth could not be wholly extinguished. In every age, there are witnesses for God, men who cherished faith in Christ as the only mediator between God and man, who held the Bible as the only rule of life, and who hallowed the true Sabbath. How much the world owes to these men, posterity will never know. They were branded as heretics, their motives impugned, their characters maligned, their writings suppressed, misrepresented, or mutilated. Yet they stood firm, and from age to age maintained their faith in its purity as a sacred heritage for the generations to come. One group of these faithful witnesses for God was the Waldenses. Their doctrine stood out like the majestic mountains that surrounded them, in marked contrast to the false doctrine put forth from Rome. Their religious belief was founded upon the written word of God, the true system of Christianity. But those humble peasants, in their obscure retreats, shut away from the world and bound to daily toil among their flocks and their vineyards, had not by themselves, arrived at the truth which opposed the dogmas and heresies of the apostate church. Theirs was not a faith newly received. Their religion was passed down as an inheritance from their forefathers. Italy is a land of contrast. In the north, there are snow-capped mountains and alpine meadows. Toward the south, we find a mild Mediterranean climate. And in the heart of this country is Rome, sitting, as it were, a queen in the midst of the seas. In the north dwelt the Church of the Alps, the land of the Waldenses. As if carved from the mountains, the Piedmont valleys spread like spokes in a giant wheel. The origin of the Waldenses is lost in the night of centuries. Their tradition declares that they were driven from southern Italy to the Alpine valleys during the second and third centuries. Let us go back in time to the early Christian era of pagan Rome. Paul, a gray-haired old man, was taken to Rome as a prisoner. While in Rome, Paul, though chained to a soldier, was allowed to witness in his own rented house for two years. In less than two years, the gospel found its way to Nero's imperial halls and throughout Italy. Nero the emperor of Rome, bore the impress of Satan. He was fierce, debased, and corrupt. Under his reign, Paul was confined to a dark and dismal prison awaiting execution. Nero ordered the beheading of Paul, 
thus silencing one of Christ's greatest witnesses. But his influence and written word live on. The persecution of Christians, beginning under Nero about the time of the martyrdom of Paul, continued with greater or lesser fury for centuries. Many gave their lives to follow Christ. They were the objects of popular hatred and suspicion. They were condemned as rebels against the empire, as foes of the government and pests to society. Great numbers were sentenced to death because they would not worship false deities and acknowledge the emperor as God on earth. Their punishment was often made the chief entertainment of public festivities. Vast multitudes assembled to enjoy the sight of Christians sentenced to death, placed in the Colosseum to be torn apart by wild beasts. Under the fiercest persecutions, these witnesses for Jesus kept their faith unsullied. At the beginning of the fourth century, during the time of Diocletian, many of these persecuted Christians fled to northern Italy. These forerunners of the Waldenses settled in the valleys of the Piedmont and became known as the people of the valleys, or the Vaudois. As the persecution of the Christians became more furious, the violence in pagan Rome also increased. Constantine, an emperor of Rome in the fourth century, observed that those Caesars who had persecuted the Christians usually came to a bad end, while the number of Christians continued to grow. Emperor Constantine, through a supernatural experience, professed to accept Christianity. On his way to battle, he claimed to have heard a voice, and upon looking up, saw a cross in the sky and heard the words, in this sign, conquer. Yet he continued on in his pagan forms of worship. This nominal conversion of Constantine caused great rejoicing. But rather than converting the world to Christianity, the world cloaked with a form of righteousness walked into the church. Christianity and paganism were now combined. The sun, universally celebrated as the invincible guide and protector of the emperor of Rome, received more of Constantine's devotion than did the Lord Jesus Christ. This coin shows Constantine on one side and Apollo the sun god on the other. When Constantine claimed to accept Christianity, the sun god Apollo, often pictured with the rays of the sun coming out of his head, became the image of Christ for the Christian church. The emblems of the sun are often found in the art of the Roman church, portraying paganism combined with Christianity. At the very heart of the Vatican complex in Rome lies an immense solar wheel, a cross within a cross. In the center of this wheel is an obelisk a symbol associated with sun worship. In pagan religions, the sun has always been a symbol for life. The obelisk represented the male organ of reproduction. The solar wheel, also a fertility symbol, represented the sun, moon, and stars. These pagan symbols can be seen in temples all over the world, and their origins can be traced back to ancient Babylon. This oculus, in one of the great domes of St. Peter's, allows the rays of the sun to shine through. Notice the solar wheel around the opening. This dome and oculus, symbolizing the sun, are part of the Pantheon, Rome's oldest pagan temple. It was completed in 27 BC and dedicated to all gods. St. Peter's, modeled after the Pantheon, copied much of its symbolism in architecture, even to the point of duplicating the obelisk placed in front of it. 
At one time, statues of the gods were placed at the base of the dome inside the Pantheon. People worship before this statue of Peter, which was originally the idol of Jupiter, a pagan god, taken from the Pantheon and placed near the altar in St. Peter's. To the left of this magnificent altar, with its colossal serpent columns, is a statue of Mary, entitled La Verita, meaning the truth. In the Roman church, it is said of Mary, I am the way, the truth, and the life. She has her foot on the world, showing her power over it, and in her arms is a startling sight. She is not holding the infant child Jesus, as we would expect, but she is holding the sun, a golden sun disk. The first queen of Babylon, named Semiramis, was said to have given birth to the sun god. She was called the queen of heaven, just as Mary is called the queen of heaven by the Roman Catholic Church. During the first few centuries after Christ's ascension, the loyal followers of Jesus watched apostasy creeping into the Christian church. They saw the need to separate themselves from this apostasy. As they observed church and state combining their powers to enforce religious practices, to be followed by all, or suffer civil penalties. On the seventh day of March in 321, Constantine gave the first public measure enforcing Sunday observance. This edict required townspeople to rest on the venerable day of the sun. Constantine, Emperor Augustus, do have pity us. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. In the country, however, persons engaged in agriculture may freely and lawfully continue their pursuits, because it often happens that another day is not so suitable for grain sowing or for vine planting, lest by neglecting the proper moment for such operations, the bounty of heaven should be lost. During the first centuries, most of the Christian world worshipped God on the seventh day, as had the apostles. When the Edict of Constantine did not prove a sufficient substitute for divine authority, Eusebius, a bishop of Rome who sought the favor of princes, advanced the claim that Christ had transferred the sanctity of Sabbath to Sunday. Those who continued to cherish the seventh-day Sabbath were made enemies of the state and of the church. The Wallensees took the Bible as their only rule of faith, abhorred the idolatry of the papal church, and rejected their traditions, holidays, and even a Sunday, but kept the seventh-day Sabbath and used the apostolic mode of baptism. Justinian ascended the throne of Constantinople as the emperor of the East in 527. He was a shrewd politician, and in an effort to extend his rule over the whole of the Roman Empire, he realized his need of securing the cooperation of the Catholic Church, which by this time was highly organized. In 538, a new order of popes began with Vigilius, now the popes no longer belonged solely to the church, but were men and rulers of the state. Justinian had given the Pope of Rome the power to be the head of all bishops and the true and effective corrector of heretics. Thus, by the sixth century, the papacy had become firmly established. Its seat of power was fixed in the imperial city and the Bishop of Rome was declared to be the head over the entire church. Paganism had given place to the papacy. From 538 to 1798, Europe lapsed into the Dark Ages, and the atrocities committed under papal rule revealed one of the greatest persecuting powers in history. 
And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. Now began the 1260 years of papal oppression foretold in the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Behind the lofty bulwarks of the mountains, the Waldenses found a hiding place. Here for a thousand years, witnesses for the truth maintained the ancient faith. Deprived for centuries of a visible church and forced to worship in caves and dens, the Waldenses' strength was in the word of God. This intimate knowledge of God's word was their only light. The Waldensian ministers were trained as missionaries. Their school was in the almost inaccessible solitude of the deep mountain gorge of the Pra del Tour. Their studies were severe and long continued, embracing the Latin, Roman, and Italian languages. After several years of study and retirement, they were consecrated to God's work by the laying on of hands. Everyone desiring to enter the ministry was first required to gain an experience as an evangelist. Every year in September, the barbs or uncles, as their pastors were called, held a general council to review the work of each student, to examine and ordain young ministers, and to select the missionaries who were to visit the distant churches in Italy and other countries. Each was to serve three years in some mission field before taking charge of a church at home. This service, requiring at the outset self-denial and sacrifice, was a fitting introduction to the pastor's life in those times that tried men's souls. The youth who received ordination to the sacred office saw before them not the prospect of earthly wealth and glory, but a life of toil and danger and possibly a martyr's fagot. The missionaries went out two by two as Jesus sent forth his disciples. With each young man was usually associated a man of age and experience who was held responsible for the training of his young companion and whose instruction the youth was required to heed. These co-laborers were not always together, but often met for prayer and counsel, and thus strengthened each other in the faith. To have made known the object of their mission would have ensured its defeat. Therefore, they carefully concealed their real character. Every minister possessed a knowledge of some trade or profession, and the missionaries carried out their work under cover of a secular calling. Usually, they chose that of merchant or peddler. They carried silks, jewelry, and other articles, at that time not easily purchasable, save at distant marts. And they were welcomed as merchants, 
where they would have been spurned as missionaries. All the while their hearts were lifted up to God for wisdom to present a treasure more precious than gold or gems. They secretly carried about with them their handwritten copies of the Bible, in whole or part. And whenever an opportunity was presented, they called the attention of their customers to these manuscripts. If an interest to read God's word was thus awakened, some portion was gladly left with those who desired to receive it. Often the missionary would say these words to those that showed a genuine interest in the truth. Friends, we have treasures far more valuable than the ones we have shown you. If you will protect us from the priests, I will tell you about them. I have a brilliant gem from God himself, for through it comes true knowledge of God. And I have another that lights the fire of God's love in the heart of the one who owns it. At the end of each day, the two missionaries would return to their room and ask the Lord's blessing on their day's work. These pious men were great prayer warriors. Our rule of conduct should be the work of Jesus. He who will confess me on the earth, I will confess in heaven. And I will deny him in heaven who has denied me on earth. We prefer to be repulsed by the papacy rather than by our Savior. At times, they were caught and thrown in dismal prisons where they suffered great agony for the word of God and for the testimony they bore. Many were tortured and placed on the horrible rack. It was during this time that the Waldenses claimed the promises of God. They kept a pure faith in spite of torture, cold, destitution, and loss of life in the Alpine mountains. They refused to give up the Bible, to confess to priests, to bow down to the wafer and believe it to be the body of Christ, or to acknowledge the Roman pontiff as the vicar of Christ. <laughs> 